Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tolt Studio. I'm Kimberly Ogbayani, the Operations Manager for Tolt Yarn and Wool. Tolt Studio is our new education space, a space where we can connect with you every month with special guests, teachers, designers, creators, and community voices to further the enrichment of your craft and yourself. We are thrilled to share an hour with Marcelin Smith, also known by her Instagram handle at HeyBrownBerry. Marcelin's patterns, knit-alongs, her YouTube channel, and her work on the Can or Creative Advocacy and Networking Retreat have inspired us and drawn us in. So without further ado, please welcome Marcelin. Hello. I, I just need a second to look at all of these beautiful faces. This is amazing. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate that intro. Good evening, everybody. I'm on the East Coast, so it's 9 p.m. for me, and it is a thrill to share my birthday with you. Today is my birthday, and I am so happy to spend this time with all of you. It's a pleasure to be part of Tolt Studio. I think this is a wonderfully accessible education and community experience. So thank you so much for being here. I can see in the chat popping up happy birthday messages. I'm honored, thank you so much. I asked uh, Kimberly and Lindsay if I could just spend a little bit of time chatting with you. I prepared a couple of slides. Hopefully they won't be too, too boring. This is definitely nothing that will require a pop quiz, but I thought I'd share some stuff with you initially about my design journey and why I've chosen to live a world full of socks. And then hopefully after that, we can open the floor to many of you to participate and ask questions as you like. And we have a special treat and surprise for you as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the happy birthday wishes. That's very sweet. I'm gonna share a slide and just ask Kimberly to confirm if you guys can see that slide. I can see you nodding. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Welcome friends, thank you all for being here. As Kimberly said, my name is Marcelin. I do answer to Hey Brownberry and you can find me as Hey Brownberry everywhere that I spend time on the internet, primarily on Instagram, on my YouTube channel. And I also have designs on Ravelry and in my Etsy shop. So uh, feel free to check those out if you haven't before. And if you ever wanna get in touch with me, I'm HeyBrownberry at gmail.com. I am Coming to you from South Florida, I live just north of West Palm Beach. I see one of my former Florida knit buddies out there, Carrie Lynn. I'm gonna just embarrass her and say, hey, Carrie Lynn, I miss seeing you. <laughs> I've been living in Florida for many years and oddly enough, I still love wool. If any of you know about or have been to Florida, you might find that a strange choice for a hobby as it is hot and hotter here. Those are our two seasons. Um, I've been designing now for only about three years, but I've been knitting since about 2005 and have been in love with woolly wools for a long, long time. So I had the opportunity to chat with Kimberly a bit about what I wanted to cover tonight, and it really helped as my thoughts around what to share with you. Um, so I'll start with a question that I've received before. Uh, so Mars, why socks? Why choose socks as a passion? as a thing to teach people to knit and as an object to design? And my very tongue in cheek answer is why not? Why not socks? <laughs> uh, as a beginning knitter, I like many of you potentially thought socks were this great mystery item. I heard about the magic of the heel turn. Um, I heard about you know, the techniques to get a sock to fit properly and it all seemed very mysterious. Um, and once I knit my first pair of socks, I struggled to get them to fit properly. And for whatever reason, that just became a challenge for me instead of an obstacle. Um, so why not socks? I find sock knitting to be therapeutic. I find it to be empowering. And I'm hoping I can convince some of you if you're not sock knitters already to give it a try. Um, socks are a small canvas, and I use the word canvas because I feel like you can express a lot through, um, through techniques and through texture and through patterning on socks on a pretty small circumference, although most socks are done on fine yarn and tiny needles, so I will give a nod to the fact that that small canvas is made up of hundreds and hundreds of stitches, but by comparison to a shawl or a sweater, you're working in a pretty small palette 
and you can do a lot in that area and often there's a big reward. I find socks to be a practical project. Very often I will Kitchener the toe on a sock or cast off the cuff and put them right on my feet. That's actually one of my favorite things to do. It's a reminder that all that time that I spent knitting was worth it because now I have something useful and practical. And I live in Florida, it is warm, but we live by air conditioning here. There's always a reason to have a little something on if you're indoors. Um, and I've had the great fortune to travel to many places where socks were actually necessary. So as a practical project, it makes it worth the learning and the time that I spend to knit socks. I consider socks to also be sneaky swatches. And I say sneaky because as you're working on a sock, you may be learning techniques that will transfer very easily to any other project. And most of us have now seen or considered projects knit in quote unquote sock yarn. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, fingering weight yarns, finer yarns. We have so many amazing designers out there who have developed designs and projects for fingering weight yarn. Well, with that small canvas of a sock, you can try out techniques for increasing and decreasing for lace and for cables and get to know a fingering weight yarn pretty well on that small project. And once you figure out the needle size and fabric that you like, you can then translate that into another project. And that transfer of techniques and that knowledge and learning about the gauge and the handle and the fabric of a yarn, I think is a great reason to try something like sock knitting. So this is just a couple reasons why I have spent so much time in the last few years talking about and teaching about socks. So as an item, I personally feel that socks get neglected when it comes to conversations about fit. Most of us know you do not want to spend weeks or months knitting a sweater only to find out that it doesn't fit you. You don't want to spend a lot of time knitting a shawl that you think is going to be a wearable blanket that you cuddle up in and it turns out it's really just a kerchief neck warmer. We care a lot about fit when it comes to other items in knitting but when I first started teaching sock knitting, I realized that this question of fit was not one that came up very often when it came to socks. And the reason it was important to me was because of how I started. So when I started knitting socks six or seven years ago in particular, I knit pair after pair of socks that did not fit me. And when I say they didn't fit me, I went through all the things you can think of. Couldn't get the cuff over my heel knit the socks and they were so slouchy that I would walk around in them for 10 minutes and they'd be slipping down into my shoes. Uh, beautiful patterning that didn't show up because once it was stretched over my foot, didn't look so good. I went through all the trials you can think of. Now, my husband will tell you that was a great period of time because he got a lot of pairs of socks that I abandoned because they didn't fit me. And I'll let you in on a secret. I wear a US women's 10 and a half Shoe, for me to knit socks is a commitment. <laughs> the average US women's size is about a six, seven, or eight. So I've got a few inches on most of you when it comes to making a sock project happen. And for them to not fit me well was really a problem for me. Not to mention the investment in yarn, um, beautiful hand dyed yarns that are worth every penny, but you're reminded of those pennies when a project doesn't work out. So that process of trial and error led me to explore a bit more and try to take some of what I had learned from other projects and apply it to my sock knitting. And I loosely call this a knit to fit approach. Now, just like any other knit item, I am a knitter and a crocheter, but most of what I'm talking about today has to do with knit socks. And like any other knit project, if you start with good information, you'll get a good outcome. So, do most of you consider the concept of gauge when you're knitting your socks? Maybe, maybe not. My students in classes I've taught, when I said, okay, we're gonna knit a swatch and bring it to class, they say, I thought this was a sock knitting class. Do you knit a gauge swatch for socks? <laughs> 
I have been an advocate for understanding the measurements in your sock project as soon as possible so that you can make every part of a sock fit every part of your foot and leg. I believe that knit to fit is what allows us to make socks that fit well, but also last longer. If a sock is too big and it's sliding around in your shoes and it's not holding up well, the likelihood is you're going to get a lot of wear in places that will cause holes that require mending or cause you to not want to wear those socks at all. If a sock is too small and you put it on your foot and it's cutting off your circulation, that's not an enjoyable experience and you're likely not going to wear that. Back to what I said about practical projects, they're only practical if you love them and wear them. So when I teach sock knitting, I talk about areas of a sock that are important for fit. Empower yourself to care about how they fit so they'll last you a long time. I have a couple examples of my patterns here and I'm just gonna use one of them to show you the key areas. Most of you are familiar with key areas on a sock. So you see here we have the toe. There are ways to knit sock toes to fit your feet exactly. If I were to pull each one of you and have you draw an image of your foot just at the toe area, we'd have some rectangles and we'd have some pointy angles going to one side and we'd have some kind of wonky shapes like my feet that require special consideration just at the toe. If a sock toe doesn't fit well, it's noticeable. Then we have kind of the main area of the sock that goes over your instep and sole. If that's too tight or too loose, or the patterning doesn't look the way you expected, you're not gonna enjoy that. The big area, and one that I find most people struggle with, is right across what's called the gusset in most patterns. It really covers the heel and ankle and over across the top of the ankle, a key fit area. Knit to fit typically comes down to getting that part right. I've heard people say, I have a high arch. Or like me, I have really flat feet. Or my feet are really wide at the ankle. Or I have really narrow feet, but then my toes spread out. It's interesting to think that if these were body parts anywhere else, we would do what we could to make them fit. Bust measurement, waist measurement, shoulders, back versus front. I would say empower yourself to take that same approach when it comes to the parts of your sock. And then as we talked about on the leg, if this area in the cuff and leg is too tight, it's not going to be comfortable. Um, down to what type of ribbing you choose and how long you choose to knit a sock, all of those things matter when it comes to knitting to fit. Finish plus good fit equals sock knitting bliss. And then once you've figured out what is a good fit for your socks, if you're knitting with the similar type of yarn each time, what you can do is develop a recipe. I have a sock recipe that I use because I actually prefer to knit left and right socks. And I do my sock toes, either decreases or increases depending on the direction that I'm knitting, so that I have a left foot and a right foot. And it's just as simple as where I place those increases or decreases so that they're shaped to fit each foot and over time, when you wear them, they kind of stay that way, and I know which one to pull on to which foot, and they fit me the best that way. Um, I know exactly how many stitches around that I want in any area of the sock, and I can actually take that as a recipe to other patterns. And yes, even though I'm a designer, I love knitting other people's patterns. There is something about letting go and letting someone else worry about the directions. So when I do that, I'll take a look at the pattern as it's set up, and I'll know, well, in order for me to achieve the fit that I want in this area of the sock, I'm going to need to apply my own recipe to this pattern. It's a low risk project. The worst case scenario is you may have to pull out a few rounds if you bother to stop to check for fit. And honestly, if you're not loving it, there's no reason to continue doing it. I have frogged socks before. It's not the most fun thing. I've frogged sweaters before. That can be devastating, I'm just saying. <laughs> so taking the transferable techniques for fit is also a good way to use your sock knitting to empower the rest of your making. So many options. 
when we talk about this one project type, there are so many options when it comes to socks. So in the category of sock styles, I don't claim that any of this is comprehensive and maybe some of you have even tried styles and techniques that I'm not aware of yet. I would love to hear about them. But when it comes to style, some of the most common are toe up, cuff down. Um, you can do different heel types. You can knit different toe shapes. You can use texture or not. Uh, the length that you knit your socks, shorties versus mid calf versus knee high, um, and the amount of ease you want in a sock. Anybody remember slouchy socks from like the 80s? Anyone? <laughs> You know, that was a thing where you knit the leg of the sock or you had, you, you purchased socks that had a leg that was slouchy on purpose and that was a whole look. So ease throughout the sock, just different areas that you can modify. And when you add yarn types to those styles, you can take the same pattern and have a completely different project each time. I consider that in my designs. Um, I wanna give a shout out to my tech editor, Jess. I'm embarrassing her too, Jessica Schwab. She's a tech editor, make note. <laughs> she has been such a huge part of my design journey. And one of the things that working with her helped me to understand is in each pattern, I'm looking for a way to make the style or the technique or the yarn that you're using a part of why you would knit this project in particular. My patterns are learning tools and I like to pick one or two things, I call them pro tips in my patterns, that you can take from that sock pattern and apply to some other sock pattern or some other making project. And so when I look at style and I think, okay, this is great, we're gonna do this cuff down because I wanna be able to give people good instructions for knitting a sock from the cuff, but what else can we do? How can we incorporate fit when you're talking about going from the leg down to the toe? Where are the fit areas that we need to think about for a heel flap or a basic heel or a flegal heel? Um, these are things that I hope my patterns will offer to people who choose to knit them. And there are so many of those style elements that can be modified by you. I actually have people write messages to me and ask me, is it okay if I knit this pattern top down even though it's written toe up? Absolutely. I did have a person ask me once if they could skip the cables in my cable sock pattern though. That was, that was unexpected. <laughs> of course you can do that. I'm not sure you want a cabled sock pattern for that purpose, but yes, you can modify this style for many of these elements. Um, I use different heel types in my socks and some people have a heel type short row heel and afterthought heel that fits them beautifully. And most of my sock patterns are written in a modular way so that you can insert that because I, I want it to work well for you. Aside from the actual style of the sock, then you talk about methods for knitting them. So just talking about needle types, you can knit socks magic loop. You can use double pointed needles, um, two circular needles, nine inch circular needles. I recently got myself a set of those Addy brand Flexi Flips, which are like bendy double pointed needles. Um, I'm not aware of other, I haven't tried other types other than these, but from the perspective of options, I feel like amongst this list, there's gonna be a perfect fit for you. And in fact, with each project, one method might work better than another. I tend to knit my socks now on double pointed needles or Magic Loop. And I tend to knit them concurrently. So I have one sock going on one set of needles and another sock going on another set of needles. And I knit them in sections and I kind of uh, knit them in parallel to each other. That helps me avoid second sock syndrome most often because I feel like I'm always making progress. Um, I used to knit exclusively, exclusively on Magic Loop. Uh, and sometimes I would knit two socks at a time on Magic Loop. So I've tried different things and just really have settled on methods that make me feel like I can get into a rhythm, which is my goal with most, most of my sock projects. I'd like to get to a point where the knitting feels rhythmic and relaxed. So I want to share, just before I wrap up with my slides, a few fun facts with you. Um, when I share this with students in my classes, they are surprised by some of this and I've actually had people challenge me and say no way. So I learned that your forearm length and that's from your wrist bone down to just before your elbow 
is actually the same length as your foot. And all of you are looking at your arm now and going, no, no shot. I would never knit a sock this long. I've measured mine 10 and a quarter inches almost to, <laughs> to the fraction of an inch, um, which is a great thing if you want to knit a sock pair of socks as a gift for someone and you don't want to tell them, you just randomly go up to them and measure their arm and be like, don't ask me any questions. <laughs> and you'll at least know how long to make the foot of their sock. Another fun fact is that the circumference, this is the measurement around your palm, not including your thumb, this area all the way around your palm, for most people is about the same circumference as around your foot. And why would that matter? Back to knit to fit. If you know your gauge and you know the kind of ease that you want in a sock and you just measure around your hand, mine happens to be nine inches, I typically subtract about an inch so that I need an eight inch sock to get a nice snug fit. Um, that's another way you can do a measurement. Absolutely, you can bend over and measure that on your foot if you like, but you know, now you know a fun fact to share at your next trivia night. And then, my preferred method for knitting socks is to knit them toe up. So start from the toe with a closed cast on and knit them up to the cuff, primarily because I can try them on as I go. And I know now for myself the fit that I love and how long to make them. But if you're just starting out or you want to try a toe up pattern, from the tip of your middle finger to just the beginning of your wrist is about the length you should knit before beginning the heel on your sock. And that goes for most heels. I tend to use the Flegel heel in my patterns, which is just a simple symmetrical heel increase. Um, short row heels or even a heel flap and gusset that's knit from the toe up. If you knit your sock toe and body from the tip of your middle finger to about the base of your palm, after that point it's a good time to start your heel. Just fun things you can do to measure as you go. Or, you know, if you are out somewhere and you're without your tape measure or measuring tools, pull your sock on over your hand, figure out if you're good to go. Some fun facts to share with you. Controversial opinion. <laughs> sock yarn, in my opinion, is yarn that you use to make socks. It's not fingering weight yarn. It's not only four ply yarn. It's not only fine yarns. It's not only hand dyed yarns. It is the skein of yarn that you picked up to make a pair of socks. <laughs> that is your sock yarn. And I make that point because whether you're a beginner or an experienced sock knitter, there really is no should that should bind you into a specific type of yarn. I've fallen in love with farm yarns. I love DK and worsted weight yarns. I've knit probably so much fingering weight yarn in my life that I just don't have to do it every single time anymore. And I feel like there's a great way to free yourself from some of those shoulds by picking a yarn that you love, knitting to fit according to your gauge, and making a pair of socks that you love. Um, I happen to know that Tolt has some excellent choices in the sock yarn category. Brands like Birch Hollow Fibers, Farmer's Daughter's Fibers, and Retrosario sock yarns. Um, in talking with Kimberly, I feel like these are great substitutes. If you choose to knit my patterns, I picked these brands in particular because Birch Hollow Fibers, for example, Robin is an incredible dyer. She has a color sense that is out of this world to me. And she has both um, superwash and non-superwash options. She has nylon free options. And her yarns would work well in any of my patterns because she tends to choose breeds that are plump and round and show texture really well and those colors just pop. Um, Farmer's Daughter Fibers, also a huge, huge fan. Um, she's got a BFL nylon blend that's beautiful. BFL, for those of you who may not have tried it, is a very bouncy, springy breed. Um, it feels good on the feet, just saying. <laughs> Uh, some nylon in there for strength. It's a really good combination. When it comes to cables and twisted stitches and other textures, uh, that tends to work really well. And then Retrosaria, I got a special place in my heart for the woolly wools, the nylon free yarns as well. And they have um, Mondine, which is just a, a gorgeous yarn to knit with. Very strong, very sturdy. 
Um, so I just picked those three out because I know that Tolt happens to offer them. And I thought if you are a Tolt fan, then you've got some great options for soft yarn. So that is what I had to share with you guys from a, a more structured point of view. Um, I want you to know that access, there are a few things that are really important to me. Um, representation, I want you to see my brown face talking about socks. And I think Tolt has done a great job of really increasing um, the access to folks like me and you know, opening me, opening their community up to me. So it's important to me to show people that, you know, brown people knit, brown people design socks, brown people love wooly wools. And so that's a piece of it. Access is a piece of it. And I'm trying to offer to the community what I feel like I get all the time. Um, in terms of education on my YouTube channel, I do provide tutorials and other things to help you. Um, my patterns, you can always see in my patterns how to reach me if you need assistance um, on the Ravelry group or on Instagram. If you've got questions, I am there and willing to help you with them. So if you need a Hey Brownberry how-to, I got your back anytime. And uh, yeah, that covers it. We have a special, special treat for you. I wanted to offer you all a gift on my birthday. And we thought that kicking off the Q&A portion of this session, it would be great to do that with a little giveaway. I got it here. It's not just a picture, by the way. <laughs> Kimberly, should I talk a little bit about what I've got here for the giveaway first before we pull a winner? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I'm very fortunate that because of my YouTube channel and some of my social media platforms, very generous people reach out to me from time to time and offer me uh, the opportunity to share their products and their passion projects with some of my viewers and followers. Um, there's a lovely woman whose name is Denise who invented the sock ruler. Some of you may be familiar with it. I'll hold it up a little bit closer. It's just got measurements on it here that you can see and a rounded tip it's called the sock ruler. Now, I was tickled to learn that my sock ruler actually says on it, patent pending. I've had this so long that I got mine when Denise had not yet patented the sock ruler. Well, now she has. So the winner will receive a patented sock ruler in a very nicely packaged sock ruler and a skein of this sock yarn from my friend Carola. And this is, uh, Corolla's brand is Otherworldly Yarns, and this is a yarn that I use for my now and next sock pattern, so you can kind of see how it knits up. She's an excellent dyer as well. So I wanted to offer in the giveaway a skein of Corolla's yarn and Denise's sock ruler get you most of the way through your next sock project. And we thought the easiest way to do this was just to draw from the list of participants who've joined tonight. So I'm going to do a random number draw. I see 101 people in the participant list, which is amazing. So minus myself and my two co-hosts, that would be 98. 98 beautiful makers. All right, let's see if this works. Pick a number between one and 98. The answer is 36. Okay. So to give away this prize, the answer was 36. I'm gonna count 36 people down from below Lindsay on the participant list. You guys, keep me honest here. Talk amongst yourselves while I count. Okay, our winner is Karen, no last name. Sorry, not Karen Henderson. Karen, no last name. <laughs> if you want to identify yourself, Karen, you have won the sock ruler and this socks game. It just, it only shows me Karen with a little green square. 
So you can write an email to um, probably heybrownberry at gmail.com. Yep. To let her know your information. Yes, please send me your mailing address and I will get this out to you in the next few days. Karen, I hope you're excited about this. Let me know. Send me an email, heybrownberry at gmail.com. And I'll stop sharing now because that concludes the structured portion and now I can't wait to hear from you. Well, there were some questions earlier on, so I'll scroll back to those so that they don't get lost. Um, so. the faces and names, I recognize our fellas out there. Hi, our fella. Thank you so much for being here. There's a comment from Susan. Hi there. Um, let me message it scrolled up. Sorry about that. Just lost my spot. Thanks, Heidi. Um, Susan said she's always wanted to make a photo collection of all the different shapes of people's toes because you know, you're talking about with the knit to fit. Um, Could you send that to me, please? It'd be a great teaching tool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm not sure how to pronounce uh, if it's Mogi. Is there a, a one size fits all approach for knitting gift socks? Oh, that's a great question. The first thing that comes to mind is tube socks with no heel and ribbing. So if you get a nice fabric on a fully ribbed sock, say a two by two rib, and you skip the heel, pretty good chance that it'll fit in most feet. I mean, you have to for adult versus child and do a little bit of judgment there, but um, without having to put in a heel, you could probably do well. And ribbing gives you that elasticity, which will give you a lot of room in terms of ease. Mm -hmm. There's a question about the flegal heel, but you pretty much explained it, and then there was a, a link shared to explain. But. Yes, the flegal heel, and I actually call it the basic gusset heel. My first sock pattern was this Pebbles and Pathways uh, ribbed and textured sock, and you'll see the heel here. The reason I call it the basic gusset heel is because it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the easiest way I explain it is that as you're, this is from the toe up. So as you're knitting the foot of the sock, point where you your heel, remember our, our measurement trick, um, you start to knit a symmetrical set of paired increases on either side of the sole part of the sock. So you end up with this kind of triangular piece and that triangular piece steadily increases. And uh, in my sock patterns, I give you a formula for how much to increase that uh, heel section. And then what happens is you knit a short row heel turn, that little cup to cover the small back curve portion, and then you begin to decrease back down. So the fabric that you created in that symmetrical triangle begins to decrease back down and cover that ankle portion and over the top of the sock. Um, I find it one of the simplest heels to execute because most of us know how to do paired increases and decreases and the short row section is is very small okay and there was uh i would love to hear a needle strategy and i know you talked a little bit about it but maybe if you have anything to expand on like how how you do that yeah needles um it's a it's definitely a personal preference thing so i think when deciding about what needle methods to use what i typically do is figure out Am I going to knit one sock at a time or two socks at a time? If it's two socks at a time, because that works really well for me, Magic Loop is probably the way to go because you have that long circular cable to work with. Um, your gauge should be pretty spot on between one sock to another and you don't have to worry about second sock syndrome. Uh, I have switched over to DPNs because I actually like the rhythm of switching from one double pointed needle to the next. It forces a slight break which for me, repetitive motion is important. I knit quite a lot. And that little bit of a stop to reposition the yarn and move to the next needle is helpful for me. And I don't mind knitting one sock at a time. Um, for some people, if it's more about sort of a meditative, very rhythmic knit, nine inch circulars tend to work well because you really are just knitting in the round for most of the sock. I have a hard time with them because I'm five foot six, I should be six foot one. I have really long fingers and toes. Um, I have a hard time gripping nine inch circular needles and so it doesn't become rhythmic for me, but I know people who swear by them. So how many socks do you wanna knit at once? What kind of rhythm are you looking for in your knitting? And then I have to throw in there, 
Try something new and see if you like it. Try a different needle type and see if you like it. There's also a compliment here I don't want you to miss. Um, Trisha Bullock says, I love all the extra details and directions in your sock patterns. Trisha, thank you so much. She's knit a beautiful pair of socks very recently. If you guys are not watching the Best Day Ever podcast, could you please go and subscribe and binge watch it? <laughs> thank you so much. It gives me such joy when I see people making my patterns. I that, that never gets old for me to see how people execute those directions and put their own spin on it and yarn choices and so on. So I appreciate that. Yeah, there's lots of great little things. There's also a mention of Earth Tones Girl has a great video on two at a time socks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Denise, Denise DeSantis is Earth Tones Girl just about everywhere, including on YouTube. And she has put incredible work into tutorials she actually inspired me to give top-down sock pattern writing a try because she has such excellent support for sock knitting on her channel. Highly, highly recommend. Um, so I wanted to just ask for you to share about like where, how did you go from being a knitter to being a designer? What, what inspired you to transition to that? Yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm still in recovering imposter syndrome stage. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just now claiming the designer title. Uh, you know, I recently realized that we probably put a lot of myth power around the idea of being a designer. And really what it is, is when you decide to share something openly that made sense to you, that clicked for you, that improved your experience, and it's different than whatever the plan was, or it just came to you as an idea, you have essentially done a design. You know, maybe capital D designer means you put the work in to formalize that and document it and then publicly share it. For me, the journey was somewhat uh, accidental and then motivated by a friend of mine. Um, my first sock pattern is Pebbles and Pathways. And many years ago, I knit I guess what you call the prototype for these socks for my daughter. And it was just because I had knit enough socks at that point that I realized I could take the formula for how many stitches to cast on and the length of these socks and then put whatever I want on the foot and leg of this item. And that's what I did. I knit a pair of socks for her with some cables and texture because that's what I love to do. And then a friend said to me, I dare you to write that up and I dare you to publish it. <laughs> I was like, oh, nobody cares about how I do cables and texture and a sock. And she really encouraged me to just give that part of it a shot, the public sharing. And I did, and it was beautifully received. I actually published that on my birthday three years ago. And I was so shocked that people wanted my recipe for something, but so gratified by the connection it created that the next time I had an idea, I thought, well, at least now I know the structure of the directions for a pattern like this. What if we change up the stitch pattern? What if I add a couple of tips and tricks? And it just went from there. That's awesome. Um, I found a question here. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about your swatching process for socks? Yes, I can. So I've already admitted that I have a preference for toe up sock knitting. Every sock toe I knit is a swatch. Knit a sock toe with a yarn, because if I like the fabric and I measure the gauge and I love the needles that I'm working with, the project has already begun. If I don't like any of those things, I'm only ripping out a toe. <laughs> <laughs> My swatch process. If you're going cuffed down, that may be more challenging because your ribbing gauge may be different from your body gauge, but still, if you knit the cuff on a sock and you like the needles that you're working with, you like the elasticity that you get in that cuff and you're doing an inch and a half to two inches, you go about another inch into some stockinette potentially, and you can measure that and get an understanding of that yarn. Sneaky swatches. <laughs> um, Judith Lipton says, I still fear the heel. I knit mostly hiking socks for my husband and family, so large gauge superwash. But do you have a beginner guide? I would recommend, most of my patterns have the flegal heel and that's what I would recommend for beginners. If you're comfortable doing e increases and you can follow directions for a few short rows, the flegal heel is a good one. Okay. 
Um, and then any tips on what to look for when choosing a sock pattern? Oh, great question. So I know that Ravelry is accessible to some, but not all of us. Um, but the internet is vast and amazing. You literally could type in beginner sock pattern and find some very helpful resources. Wendy Johnson had done a multitude of patterns a long time back, and many of her beginner patterns were done in worsted weight intentionally so that you could really see what you were doing. So I, I just recommend doing some searches with Ravelry. Of course, uh, my experience is that you can search by very specific parameters, like I want cuff down, or I want toe up, or I want a certain yarn weight. Um, but if you search how to knit beginner socks, that's a good way to go. If you'd like to try toe up, um, my toe up tutorial on my YouTube channel will get you started. And really from that point, um, you could probably knit most of my patterns if that's your choice. Yeah, I feel like you know, I'm just going to humble brag and say, if you have a really hard time knitting from one of my patterns, please let me know because my intent is for you to be able to follow it as a detailed guide. Um, and if you don't find what you're looking for in there, reach out to me and I'll see if we can find another pattern that's more helpful to you. Okay. Uh, there's another uh, sweet share. Um, Carol Jones says, to Mars, but everyone can read it. I spent a year trying to learn how to make socks, read a, mil read a million books, downloaded and studied half a million patterns, trying to find the perfect pattern that had magic loop with flegal heel and an easy, pretty pattern knitted toe up. I was very excited and grateful to find your pebbles and pathways pattern. At last, I felt like calling you to say thank you. So thank you now, you are my sock hero. I have a few of your other sock patterns too. <laughs> Good night, everybody, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that is so sweet. Thank you so much. That's incredible. I'm so happy that you were, that you had that experience too. Um, so I sometimes the questions are not all coming up for me. So I'm going to let it refresh a little bit. Um, okay. But Michelle says switching from Magic Loop to DPNs really had a significant impact mm -hmm. on decreasing hand pain. I don't know oh, that I would have thought about that before. You mentioned also the repetitive motion needing to just kind of stop. And yes, I mean, you, you have to, unless someone has figured out something I haven't, right? You have to take just that tiniest little break as you move to the next needle. And I've noticed that I can go a bit longer. I used to also, um, this may just be me. I used to really grip when it came to Magic Loop. I, for whatever reason, I had a very tight grip on that. I, I probably can't grip that way because of the ends of the DPNs and where they would poke into my hand. So there's not a lot of grabbing you can do. Um, that may have something to do. I'm really glad you found that relief. It tells me that you were willing to try something else to keep going, which is excellent. Um, so Andy says, do you wash the toe before you measure it? Oh, for the swatch. Great question. I personally do not, and this allows me to bring up something else about ease and sock fit. Uh, one of the things that I struggled with initially was my socks were knit too loose in many cases because when I would try them on, I would think, oh, that fabric is a bit stiff or that, that does feel a little bit tight. You know, not extreme cutting off my circulation, but it was very tight. And then if I kept going and I knit them anyway, and I soak blocked, wet block the sock, let it dry, put it on, wore it for a day, the amount of relaxation that would happen with that yarn was incredible. And this is across yarn types, but in particular, superwash yarns um, that are pretty common sock yarns, they relax and loosen up so much. So I don't wash my toe swatches or my cuff swatches, and I do knit with a good amount of negative ease. I do knit them a little bit tight on purpose because I know that that blocking and wearing process, it's gonna give you quarter inch, half inch of looseness after the fact. Absolutely you can though. I would not discourage you from doing that. It's just a toe. <laughs> okay. Um, so there, if someone has their hand raised. So Sally, um, I'm gonna ask you to unmute so you can ask your question. Well, um, hopefully that'll work. 
in the, in the future, Sally, I'll give it another try in a minute. Um, more of also, the questions about negative ease. Do you typically use more than 10% negative ease? I do not. I, I tend to say, it, well, in inch measurements, apologies to those who are um, accustomed to centimeters, just my common language. In inch measurements, anywhere from a half to a one inch negative ease. So if my foot circumference is nine inches around, I'll knit an eight, a sock that measures eight inches around. Um, I don't know if everyone has knit enough to see this, but knitwear in particular has a, quite a good give, especially stockinette stitch, um, which is knitting in the round, knitting all stitches in the round. It has quite a bit of give to it, even without ribbing. So I wouldn't go more than an inch of negative ease on a sock, probably somewhere between half to one inch. There was do also you a question about, oh, sorry. Is that do you prefer metal or wood needles for your DPNs? I actually use both almost interchangeably. I tend to actually use needle material based on the yarn that I'm knitting with. So if my yarn has a bit more grip to it naturally, like a woolier yarn or something that um, it just, it's a bit more grippy, I tend to use metal needles. For something that has a little more slide to it, to keep my stitches from sliding all over the place, I tend to use wood needles. So from a hand comfort perspective, I feel fortunate that neither one gives me trouble. So I typically pick by yarn, um, the yarn construction. Do you have a favorite cast on for toe up? The Turkish. The Turkish cast on for toe up socks is my favorite. I have a tutorial for that. And the reason it's my favorite is because it is quick and it is easy and it's effective. Essentially, you're wrapping loops around your two starter needles and you're knitting into those loops to create a closed toe beginning. Turkish cast on is my favorite. Okay. Elizabeth, Thanks. Sorry. Elizabeth asks, is it better to knit more stitches per inch at a tighter gauge than less stitches at a looser gauge if you're between sizes? More stitches per inch at a tighter gauge because when I think about longevity, that density is gonna help you in terms of wear and abrasion against those stitches. When stitches are a bit looser and there's space in that fabric and there's any opening in that fabric, that's gonna make it really easy for things like pilling and wear and tear on your sock. And I'm all about having them for as long as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. I have one other question. Do you block your socks after every wear? after you wash them? Do you block them again? Okay. No. I put them on the slot blocker for photos and then I wear them. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a question about your flexi flips, uh, bamboo or metal? Mine are metal. The Addy flexi flips that I have are metal. So I have a question. Does drying the socks on the um, the sock blocker stretch them out too much? Um, the, the sock blocker that I have, I have to, I, I apologize, I don't remember the shop that I got these from, but the ones that I have are a very hard plastic. So nothing happens to this material when it gets wet, it doesn't warp or move in any way. And these happen to fit my foot really well. However, if you, if you can see here on the camera, they tend, to, they expand up here at the top. They tend to get a bit wider up at the top. And I've seen that in many sock blockers. So if you have a longer sock, this is about a six inch leg. If you have a longer sock, your cuff ribbing would get severely stretched out up here. And in fact, I only have these socks on here right now so that I can show them to you easily. But I did not block these because they have a cable detail and I didn't want that cable detail to be stretched out. So I would base it on the shape of your sock blocker and the stitches that you have in the sock. It's not a good idea to stretch out ribbing in the blocking process. Sometimes it's hard for that elasticity to come back. I personally wouldn't stretch out things like cables if you can help it. And if your sock blocker does that, it will flatten them and you kind of lose that beautiful bounce of cables. So if the sock blocker is a good size for your, your sock, size, you should be okay, especially if it doesn't have you know, shapes that your sock fabric needs to go around. I hope that makes sense. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Robin um, asks two at a time versus one. Oh, now one at a time. Um, previously, I was a steadfast two at a time knitter, second sock syndrome avoidance. But I noticed that, and I was doing that, you know, magic loop, long cable. I noticed that the gauge on my, one of my socks was very different from the gauge on the other sock. And I'm sure it had something to do with the way I had them on the needle. But my, my hypothesis is that when the sock I was not working on would hang on the needle, that would change what was happening with the sock I was working on. So like one sock was dragging down the needles and causing a different knitting format for the other sock. And I didn't like, it was, it was not hugely noticeable, but noticeable enough between the two socks that I didn't enjoy that. So I stopped knitting two at a time. Well, I'm a new sock knitter, so I'm ha so happy to hear that because I thought, oh, I better do two at a time so I don't give up, but I, I think I'll follow the one at a time. Kate, yeah, I feel like the, um, the, the way I made up for it is just that as I cast off one, if I'm not doing them concurrently and I'm doing truly one at a time, as I cast off one, I start even the cast on of the second one. And then I'm already underway with number two. <laughs> All right. Um, Caitlin shared something fun. She says that her husband 3D printed fake feet because of the problem with sock blockers. <laughs> That's so awesome. My email address. That's amazing. Yay for supportive partners. <laughs> That's awesome. No kidding. No kidding. Um, Caitlin asked yes. if you want to see them. <laughs> yes. We'll see if we can. Yes, please. <laughs> if you raise your hand, then it will show you up at the top of the screen. Okay. Yep. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Carol's got a visitor. Oh, so cute. So cute. Do you have trouble with how do you eliminate ladders? Uh, ladders at the joins. A trick that I learned for this, um, you know, I've read different things about how to tighten up your stitches and, and so on. So a lot of people do experience this, whether it's magic loop knitting or double pointed needles. So a trick that I learned was when you're going around on your sock and you come to a join point, I think instinctively you would think, the next stitch that I knit on that new section, if I pull the yarn really tight for that stitch, it should help me tighten up the join between the stitches at this junction. In actuality, if you knit that first stitch after the junction, just as normal, and then you knit the second stitch with a slight tug, make that one a little bit tighter, it actually tightens the thread between those two stitches enough that it should help pull in and close those ladders. So not the first stitch after the junction, but the next one over. Um, another good tip is change the junction point. As you go through your sock, you might have, if it's magic loop, you split half and half, and you might have say 32 stitches on one needle and 32 stitches on the other. Shift that junction over by one or two stitches so that you're not always doing the same kind of tension in one area. You can do the same thing on double pointed needles as well. Okay, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you, Sally. So Caitlin, um, I will briefly spotlight you so you can show us these. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Started sure. right now. Okay? <laughs> Shut so up. here is what they look like. They are the size of my feet. I have a very faint memory of him grabbing my foot and measuring it like when I was asleep and being very confused about it. And then the next day he was printing the sock blocker because in his words, traditional sock blockers are stupid because of all of the forming problems and because they don't, they're not shaped like feet. So. Which is why mine have are photo props and yours are useful. <laughs> I've got a pair of fake feet, um, and they work pretty well. 
That, that is, is yeah, I think you can find the designs for like feet on my mini factory. All right. That's amazing. Just, just tell him a whole bunch of makers now think he's the coolest. <laughs> we're like, you were like, Stop every being time weird. Oh, marker. thank you. <laughs> but I will tell him again. Thank you. Thank That's you, Caitlin. So cool. All right. That's so fun. I love it. Oh. Well, this is um, last opportunity for any last questions, and then we're going to say thank you. What a treat. Yes. Oh, Marcelin, thank you so much for being with us. It, it is, is truly my pleasure. As you can see, it's not difficult for me to spend an hour talking about sock knitting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Um, Okay. You all are wonderful. Thank you for spending yep. my birthday with me. What an awesome, awesome opportunity. Thank you, Tolt. Thank you, my friends who came to join. It's my pleasure to be here. I wish you all very, very happy making. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.